I've been reflecting, you know, uh, a little bit over the last couple of days, just thinking about the busyness of life and thinking about the busyness of my life. And, I, and I'm quite frankly in one of those times again where it feels like I'm not sure I've ever had a busier time in my life. There may have been other busy times, but this one feels super busy. I, I feel pulled in a lot of directions, and maybe some of you are experiencing a season like that. Uh, not to say that the busyness isn't filled with good things, because it is. There's just so many wonderful things that are a part of this season for me. And last week was one of those things. I was boarding a plane and, and our entire family. So this is all of our kids were going to be together in Dallas. And then also uh, my, my mom and my, my wife's parents were going to be there. And we were just celebrating as a family the completion of a gymnastics career, my oldest daughter's last home meet. So it was just a, a fun time to be together. But of course, that takes me away from my normal routine. And, and while I was uh, worshiping last Sunday at, at my son's church in Texas, once again, and I don't get, you could probably appreciate this, I don't get this experience very often anymore, but almost everybody in the family there together at one moment, right? And it was just really a sweet moment. And while the preaching was going on, I was thinking about you because uh, my son's preacher was talking about the I am statements. And he was talking about these, these facts of what Jesus says about himself. Well, what we're focusing on during our series is what Jesus does. And let me tell you, what he says and what he does points to one thing. They're glimpses of glory of who he is. And that's what we're focused on as we head into Easter. Now, part of that trip obviously involves a plane ride. And we were up early, a 6 a.m. Uh, you know, flight. So we were up early heading out, and uh, it was last weekend, so there was people getting on the plane, heading through Dallas on their way to New Orleans. Does anybody know why? Yeah, apparently a lot of you do. I'm not going to ask you why you know, okay? It's Mardi Gras, and it's uh, it's the party that heads into the traditional Roman Catholic season of Lent, And of course, they find a reason to turn something spiritual into a party. Now, I don't want to say anything too negative about it, but let's just say that I think some of the folks celebrating on Tuesday, which they happen to call Fat Tuesday, okay, uh, some of the folks celebrating on Tuesday are losing perspective about what the whole deal is about. And I would say the folks that got on the plane last week with us at 6 a.m. in the morning, they had lost perspective. Some of you have heard the phrase pre-gaming. It was 6 a.m. in the morning, and these folks were tanked already, right? So there was a little bit uh, of, about them that was obnoxious, to be quite frank. Well, I'm sorry, not a little bit. And I had found myself wishing that the uh, steward who... I actually, I think it was a stewardess. She got on the speaker and actually celebrated this. And it did not help. It just emboldened these folks. And, you know, I was, well, quite frankly, a little bit irritated. So I had to check myself. Now, as I've been trying to do over the last several years, because I've traveled more in the last, well, six or seven years, when I get on a plane, I, I try, I'm not always successful, but I try to read from wheels up to wheels down. And it's been a wonderful spiritual exercise. And this last time... I just, I, I, I've been quite frankly a little bit behind on some of the reading I wanted to do. And so I was reading in the Psalms and I read in Psalm 36, these two verses, verses one and two. I have a message from God in my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. There is no fear of God before their eyes. In their own eyes, they flatter themselves too much to detect or hate their sin. Now leave that up there for a second. I I was reading through Psalm 36, and and quite frankly, I got about four or five verses past the first two verses. And and maybe you've experienced this before in your Bible reading. You know, I I was going to read several Psalms. So I'm I'm reading through, and I got to about verse 7, and I couldn't stop thinking about verses 1 and 2. Now, that's... That's a prompting. That's a prompting to go back and consider what it is you've read. So I paused. 
Now, I know some of you are like me. That, that felt like an interruption to my agenda. Does anybody know, know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I had a plan, man. So I paused and I read verses 1 and 2. And I, I went back to verse 1 and I meditated on this. This is of David, King David. I have a message from God in my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. There, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, in many places in the Bible, it says that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And what does that mean? It means several things, but at the very least, one of the primary meanings of it is this. The fear of the Lord is recognizing that my sinfulness has separated me from God. And by the way, that's what this whole journey, traditionally called Lent, is all about. It's recognizing that we have a need for a Savior because my sinfulness has separated me from God. And I found myself moving a little bit away from being irritated by, about my friends in the back of the plane to actually being concerned for them. Had they missed the main point because, well, quite frankly, the message was being watered down. That becomes a concern. We, you know, the, in the preaching of the Word, sometimes you may fall into that temptation in a different form, watering down the truth, trying to make it more palatable to those you love. I've fallen into that trap many times. That's speaking in love, but not speaking in truth. And we're supposed to do both. Now, I've erred on the other side. Anybody else where I've spoken truth, but not necessarily in a loving way? Yeah, so we've got to keep trying and pushing in and leaning in to speaking the truth in love. And verse 2 then continues, In their own eyes they flatter themselves too much to detect or hate their own sin. And I, my heart just started to grieve for the culture that we live in because, man, don't we live among a people who flatter themselves? And don't think for a minute that it doesn't affect each and every one of us in the room. We're so busy congratulating ourselves that we forget our need for a Savior. So I, I meditated on that, and then I was like, okay, good. Now I can keep, get back onto my agenda. And I got to the end of Psalm 37. I tried to turn over to Psalm 38, and I had the same moment of pause. And I read verses 37 and 38 and had to go back to them. Consider the blameless. Observe the upright. A future awaits those who seek peace, King David says. And, and I'm going to paraphrase this in the light of the fact that we know Jesus has come. Okay? A future awaits those who seek the King of Peace. Now here's one of the most uncomfortable statements I'm going to make today. And it comes from verse 38. You can already see it on the screen, right? But all sinners will be destroyed. There will be no future for the wicked. That's an uncomfortable statement. For me, I would describe it as an uncomfortable truth. For others, they might describe it as an uncomfortable statement. And if you don't believe it, guess what you have to do? You have to deny it. So clearly those who, you know, don't accept Jesus, a lot of folks who don't accept Jesus would deny verse 38. I understand why. I used to deny that. I used to, to be what what might well be described as a universalist. Hey, as long as people are sincere, because God knows I had the corner of describing on how people get to God. I still do. That was a joke. You missed that one. <laughs> right? I don't have the corner on it. Jesus does. See, that's where I finally got my head right. I stopped trying to be the one describing the path and instead repeating the words of the one who describes the path. That's what we're all called to do if we believe on the name of Jesus. It's an uncomfortable truth to think about verse 38. But nevertheless, again, it points to that truth. We and everyone we know needs a Savior. Easter matters. 
And it points forward to these two central truths, these two central tenets of the Christian faith. And the first one is this, that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. Without that truth, there is no Christianity. So when you read through, even in the Gospels and in the book of Acts, you'll see that the opponents of the early movement of the Christian faith opposed the idea that Jesus was fully God. They accused the disciples of creating a deception, for example. They accused the disciples of um, fabricating the whole thing. They had to deny that Jesus was God. Because, my friends, if you don't believe it, you what? You have to deny it. And they did. What's interesting is, a hundred years ago, there was a movement in Europe called the German Intellectual Movement, and they actually took a different tack on this. Uh, They actually started to deny the humanity of Jesus. Believe it or not, these folks were Christians. And they denied that Jesus ever lived. Their, Their theory was that Jesus was the fabrication of his followers. He was just a spiritual manifestation. Now, a hundred years later, in other words, to our day, you can't find one person, not even the most hardened skeptic who, who has really studied this fact, who will deny the historicity of Jesus Christ. People across the board, historians, theologians, and all of the above, they accept the fact that Jesus really did live. What it's shifted back to now again is you have to deny that he's God. In our day, that, that uh, debunking of him being fully God now has shifted to what Jesus says about himself. And the claim, if you do an internet search, you will, one of the most common things you will find is that Jesus never claimed to be God. And of course, because people ble- read it on the internet, they think what? That it's true. Because everything on the internet is true, right? Everybody knows that, right? So, you know, because how could it not be true? I mean, if someone took time to write that, it must be true. Listen, if you don't want to believe it, what do you got to do? You got to deny it. Because let me tell you, if Jesus is fully God and fully man, then what happened on Easter makes all the difference in the world. And what happened on Easter is the second tenet main tenet of the Christian faith, that Jesus was crucified for our sins and resurrected from the grave so that we can have eternal life. The Bible says that eternal life is knowing Jesus Christ. Not just someday, but knowing Him now. My belief in that is based on the fact that I'm changed. I am not who I was. And I know so many of you who would say the same thing. In fact, in deference to the story we're reading today, I would say this one thing. I only know Christ, as Paul says, and Him crucified. I want to seek to know nothing else. Crucified and resurrected, because that, my friends, is the basis of my hope. And I have staked my entire existence on it. And so many of you have as well. Now I know this morning there are those of you here who believe that Jesus is Lord and Savior, but you're still hedging. You're struggling. You might well be described as a universalist, and what I mean by that is the sense that you, you become convinced about Jesus, but you're hoping there's a lot of other ways. I, I get that. I understand that. This morning's for you. And then there's some of you who are still investigating. This morning's especially for you. Because as I was sitting in that church in Texas last week, and the pastor was talking about what Jesus says about himself, I was thinking about what Dave was reading to you this morning. And he read from Luke chapter 7. And I'm going to start in verse 20. John the Baptist was having a struggle with whether or not Jesus was really the Messiah. 
I don't think he had lost faith in God per se. What he was struggling with is, is Jesus really the one or is somebody else supposed to come? So he sends his followers to ask that very question. Now they come to ask him the question, are you the one? Notice with me verse 21. At that very time, they come and ask him, I mean, the more I think about it, the more humorous this becomes. They're worried about what Jesus says about himself. And he's knee deep in doing the ministry. Can you just see the irony in this? What's it say in the scripture? He was surrounded by people he had been curing who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits and gave sight to many who were, what's that say there? Blind. He's knee deep in doing the thing and they're worried about what he says. So Jesus looks back at them. He says, listen, I want want you to give a message to John. I'm going to reiterate it. He's going to reiterate what he read when he announced himself publicly, as we find it in Luke chapter 4. He gave what people would call the messianic job description from Isaiah 61. He read that about himself. He was announcing, he was saying, I am the one that God sent. They didn't like it. One instance of the telling of that story says, in Luke chapter 4, they tried to throw him off a cliff because he said it. So people recognized what he was claiming, what he was saying. So he says to John's disciples, listen, you go back and tell John. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. And I'll summarize, in case you weren't here, what Dave said last week. And here it is. You ready? This is it. Actions speak louder than words. Now, my bet is based on the... I always love it when you say something like that and people go, Mmm... There was a mmm that rippled across the whole room when I said that. I I think we would generally say, yeah, that's true. Unfortunately, my friends, if you really think about it, we live among a people who don't really believe that. We live among a people who say that what you say is far more important than what you do. In fact, we're willing to overlook what you do if we like what you say. And that's scary. Jesus instead, instead actually marries the two things. He's not, he's not saying that my words don't matter. He's saying my words mean everything. But let me tell you, what I do validates what I say. So take a look. For, stop paying attention at all to what I'm saying and just look at what I do. Because when you watch what I do, you will know what I say. Oh God, would you please give us a leader someday. And he will. Who would live like that? His name is Jesus, my friends. So when I think about the healing of the blind, that's what we're going to do in this series now leading up to Easter. Looking at each of these statements, each of these statements fulfilled in a miracle, a specific miracle. One of the miracles that comes to mind right off the pages to me of the blind receiving their sight is John chapter 9. And it's especially powerful, and I'll explain why. So in John chapter 9, we're told this story. As Jesus was going along, he saw a man blind from birth. Now this is critical, and I'll pause here. I want to make it clear. I want to reiterate the obvious. Blind from birth. He's making a point specifically because these folks had seen people who had sight, lost their sight, and then had their sight restored but they've never seen anybody who had never been able to see receive their sight. They've never seen it. And so, in verse 2, his disciples asked him. Now, I bet you they thought they were being brilliant. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, once again, this this question here, 2,000-year-old question, betrays something that's true that we're told 
over and over again in the Bible, especially in the book of Ecclesiastes. My friends, there is no philosophy and no religion, no idea of how to live that is new. There is nothing new under the sun. It just gets recycled and repackaged in different forms. Some of you recognize that statement in verse 2 or that question in verse 2 betrays a philosophical idea encapsulated in many Eastern religions. Now I'm going to ask you to tell me what you think it is. However, I'm going to warn you that I will give the manual buzzer. And I'm thinking about retiring it because too many people are getting it and then you all get gun shy. But, you know, it's so fun for me. So, are you ready? Please be correct. Be bold, though. Be bold. Because, you know, it's okay to, if you're bold and then get the manual buzzer, all right? What phil- philosophical idea is encapsulated in that question in verse 2? What is it? Karma. Ding, 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 ding. See, you get the ding, ding, ding if you get it correct. It's the karma idea. You may not even realize that, that that's not new. That wasn't made up in the East. That's made up by the Prince of Lies. So they asked this idea that's encapsulated in that Eastern philosophical opinion that's called the karma cycle. In other words, what you did in a previous life is having an effect in this life. Did the parents sin in a previous life? Did this guy sin in a previous life that now he's reaping the consequences of of being blind? And I could almost hear Jesus laugh. In verse 3, he says, Nah, no, neither. Now I want you to be clear that you understand clearly something encapsulated here. What he's saying is, neither this man sinned nor his parents. He's saying... This blindness is not the direct result of wrongdoing by either of these individuals. And you need to understand how important that is because karma does have a basis in truth, doesn't it? Uh, Jesus would describe it, or the Bible would describe it as what? You reap what you sow. So, do you reap consequences for bad choices? Yeah, of course. But not every bad thing that happens is the direct result of poor choices from a previous life. Sometimes bad things happen because this world is broken. Jesus does not deny that the blindness is caused by sin. He's denying that it's caused by some sin in a previous life. It's caused by the brokenness of the world because, my friends... If I haven't said it enough times, let me say it again. This world is not as it should be. This world is broken. That's why we need a Savior. It's the result of that first rebellion in the Garden of Eden. And now everything doesn't work right. Our DNA doesn't work right. Disease ravages both the planet and people. The, 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 the world causes devastating storms and effects. This world is spinning out of control because of sin. Make no mistake. And Jesus looks at this man, and I love what he says, this happened so that God's glory might be displayed. Now notice verse 4. He says, as long as it's day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. And while I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Now let me pause and say two things on verse 5. The first one is this. One of my favorite Bible teachers is James Montgomery Boyce. He's gone to be with the Lord a few years ago, and it just grieved my heart. But on this story, James Montgomery Boyce says this. He says, each of the miracles of healing shows humanity to be helpless in their sin. But each also shows the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ triumphant. What you need to understand, when you read what Jesus does, when you see what he did... When you see miracles in the people around you, they display the triumphant work of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. In other words, it's a glimpse of glory. It's a glimpse of seeing the one that God sent. His actions validate his words. So when Jesus says back in John chapter 9 verse 5, I'm the light of the world, he says, look at what I'm going to do. I am the pathway to finding God. And I'll import what he says in John 14 then right here. There is no other way. 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, what he says here in verse 5 of chapter 9 is a continuation of a theme that began in John chapter 8, where we're told that Jesus on the last day of the festival, as the light was being lit up in the temple courts, and they were, they were doing this because they were, they were showing what the prophecies in the Old Testament would one day be fulfilled and what it would do. At the darkest of night, the light of God would provide light so that everybody would see. And as this light was going up out of complete darkness, they would extinguish every light in the temple courts. And then as everyone was waiting expectantly, can you imagine some of you have been there where you've actually gotten away from light? Uh, you know, dark of the moon, no other lights around you. Uh, the complete darkness that you can't even see your hand in front of your face. That's what they would produce in the temple court. Then they would light up this torch that would literally be seen for miles around. And at that moment, as the torch was being lit up, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Now those were his words. People heard those words in the temple court that day, but now he repeats them. And so as you see this in John chapter 9, verse 5, he says, I'm the light of the world. Now watch what I do. Now this gets a little humorous, at least for me. Verse 6, after saying this, he spits on the ground. I just didn't see that coming. Anybody else? I mean, I know it now, but I'll tell you the first time I read it, I was like, what? Roger says this all the time in 101 when we go through it. He says, there's plenty of instances where Jesus does not do what I expect him to do. This is one of them. Jesus spits on the ground. Right? Makes some mud. Puts it on the guy's eyes. And then says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Which, of course, we're told means scent. And just so you know, there's nothing in there by accident. There's a whole message right there. But staying on the main point. The man goes and washes. Verse 8. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't isn't that? No, that can't be him. No, it's him. No, no, it can't be him. We've, it's an imposter. It can't possibly be him. You know why? Because if you don't want to believe in the miracle, guess what? You've got to deny it. And they were denying it. So they went up and said, hey, are you him? And he said, who else would I be? Of course it's me. Right? Well, how did your eyes get open then, they said. Verse 11. Well, this man they called Jesus made some mud. Now, don't you wish you were there and say, how did he make the mud? But I digress. He made some mud and he put it on my eyes. He told me to go wash in the pool of Siloam. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man, they said. I don't know. Now, just so you know, this is one of the instances where Jesus makes a clear connection that the miracle is much bigger than just the miracle. The spiritual police show up. They're the Pharisees. And they're going to do an investigation. They are going to dig in. So they grab this man's parents. And they start reading these parents the riot act. And they start going through it and attacking the parents. And the parents are fearing for their lives. So much so to the point that they say, listen, we don't we don't have anything to say. Go ask him, he's of age. What you may not recognize there is that they're disowning the son. You can imagine this for parents whose child has been born blind. They have probably begged God to heal their son. Now their son can finally see. They are so scared to acknowledge their relationship to the son that they distance themselves from him. That's how serious this claim is. They're frightened to stand up for the truth. Right? And so now they go question the blind man. And of course, he doesn't back down from the story. 
One of the most humorous things you'll ever read in the scripture comes in John chapter 9. When the blind man actually looks back at the Pharisees and says, Why do you want to seek him? Do you want to become his followers too? No. You know why they were investigating? Because they wanted to deny it. Because if you don't want to believe it, my friends, you have to deny it. Because it's the truth. One of the greatest Christian songs, if not the greatest Christian songs, is based on this story in John chapter 9. The statement of the blind man, I once was blind, but now I see. Written by John Newton, who was a slave ship trader. Slave trader, ran a slave ship. And John Newton understood well that John chapter 9 is about spiritual blindness. Jesus has an interaction with this man at the end of the chapter. He finds him in the temple courts and he says, listen, and I'm going to paraphrase, listen, it's great that you can see with your physical eyes, but it's far more important that you believe in the Son of Man. And the blind man says, where is this Son of Man that I may, may follow him? And Jesus says, the one who is speaking to you is he. And the man fell down on his knees and worshiped Jesus. Because Jesus, my friends, is fully God and fully man. He is God in the flesh. He is the one who died and rose again. And on him, by his death and resurrection, we have eternal life. There is no other name given under heaven by which we might be saved. He is the way, the truth, and the life. That's what Easter is all about. It is the central tenet of the Christian faith. And here's spiritual blindness, my friends. Spiritual blindness is so obvious that you can't miss it. If you are spiritually blind, you can't see Jesus, which means you can't see God. If you're spiritually blind, you can't seek Jesus, which means you can't seek God. If you're spiritually blind, you can't find Jesus, which means you can't find God. But Jesus says it clearly. Let me repeat it again. The greatest words in this chapter, I am the light of the world. For those of you who have been struggling to believe, wondering what it means to believe, I pray to God that you hear it clearly. Jesus is the one who was sent by God and he says, look at what I did. It validates what I say. Jesus is the one on whom you are called to believe. And Romans chapter 10 says it as plainly as can be said. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is the light of the world, fully God, fully man, died and rose again for your sins, you will be saved. And I close with this because I know there's a lot of you here this morning you waver about speaking this truth. It's tough. But it's the truth. I don't speak my words. I speak the words of the one who sent me. Listen, I don't know anything. But I do know this. I once was blind. But now I see. And I seek with all of my strength and all of my desire to speak the truth in love. There's been plenty of times in my life, as I said, that I've spoken the truth without being loving. And there's plenty of times I've watered down the message in order to be loving without speaking the truth. I'm tired with that. And done with it. And I hope you are too. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He invites you to be the sent ones. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all who agree together say, Amen. Lord God, bless your people. Encourage their faith. Build them up and strengthen them for your purposes. Father, I think about those folks on that plane last week. And I think about all those that they're an illustration of for me who are totally missing the main thing. And I just say, Lord, have mercy. First, have mercy on me and give me strength and courage. 
And Lord, give your people here strength and courage to believe and to speak the truth and to trust you in what you say and do. That we would grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. That we would be encouraged and emboldened to speak that truth in love. And we pray this in your beautiful name, Lord Jesus. Amen.